All right, Genesis chapter number 21. Let's jump right into the chapter here. Genesis chapter number 21, beginning with verse number 1. The Bible reads, And the Lord visited Sarah as he had said, and the Lord did unto Sarah as he had spoken. It's a good example of God's word not coming back unto him void. Always fulfills that which he promises it will. Verse 2, For Sarah conceived... And bear Abraham a son in his old age, at the set time of which God had spoken to him. Perfect example or parallel with uh, Mary conceiving. This, of course, being the promised seed and Jesus being the promised seed. A good foreshadowing. Verse number three, it says this. And Abraham called the name of his son that was born unto him, whom Sarah bare to him, Isaac. So they gave him the name Isaac. It's a little bit, the order, the the, uh, the word order of the verses here are a little bit different, but you find what the meaning of his name is. Normally in the Bible, the Old Testament, New Testament even, it will give you, it will give you the meaning of all of the names that are spoken. When well, you find the meaning of the name Isaac in verse number 6, it says this, And Sarah said, God hath made me to laugh, so that all, so that all that hear will laugh with me. And that's what Isaac means. So look at verse number 4. It says this, And Abraham circumcised his son Isaac, being eight days old, as God had commanded him. Verse 5, And Abraham was a hundred years old when his son Isaac was born unto him. I want you to go back now to Genesis chapter number 13. Genesis chapter number 13. Actually, go all the way back to Genesis chapter number 12. Genesis chapter number 12 is where Abraham was first introduced. Of course, at that time, he was known as Abram. But sometimes you can lose sight of the amount of time that goes by. I just want to refresh your mind quickly. So if you go to Genesis chapter number 12, this is when Abram is introduced as a character in the Bible here. And not only is he first introduced in Genesis 12, but he's actually first given the promise. The promise of a seed to come. I want you to look at uh, chapter 12, look at verse number 1. Now the Lord had said unto Abram, Get thee out of thy country, and from thy kindred, and from thy father's house, unto a land that I will show thee. And then he says, And I will make of thee a great nation, and I will bless thee, and make thy name great, and thou shalt be a blessing. Skip down to verse number 4. So Abram departed as the Lord had spoken unto him, and Lot went with him, and Abram was seventy and five years old when he departed out of Haran. So notice, he's 75 years when he leaves Haran, right? Look at verse number 5. It tells you, And Abram took Sarai, his wife, and Lot, his brother's son, and all their substance that they had gathered, and the souls that they had gotten in Haran, and they went forth to go into the land of Canaan. It says, And into the land of Canaan they came. So that's when they officially left Canaan, and he was 75 years old at that time. When you flip back over to Genesis chapter number 21, when we're studying tonight, it gives you Abraham's age there. Again, look at verse number 5 once more. It says this, And Abraham was a hundred years old when his son Isaac was born unto him. That's a substantial amount of time. When, when God came to Abraham originally, when his name was Abram, he was 75 years old. And even at that time, that's pretty far-fetched, isn't it, to think, I'm going you know, to bring forth a child. I'm going to bring forth a son that's going to grow and going to be a great nation. Not only is it far-fetched at that time, he waited 25 years in the physical sense of him having children, even when he's 100, you know, compared to being 75. But that's a long time, number two, in the sense of having to wait for a promise, isn't it? That's a very long time. Notice the patience that was needed. I want you to turn to Hebrews chapter number six. Abraham is actually praised for just that, the great patience that he had. After he exercised his faith, of course, put his faith in God and the Lord Jesus Christ, he's praised for the great patience that he had. Look at Hebrews chapter number six. I want you to look at verse number 11. It says, and we desire that every one of you do show the same diligence to the full assurance of hope unto the end. It says this, verse 12, that ye be not slothful, but followers of them who through faith and patience inherit the promises. For when God promised to Abraham, because he could swear by no greater, he swore by himself, saying, surely blessing uh, surely blessing I will bless thee and multiply I will multiply thee what chapter is that from anyone what chapter is that from 12. Genesis 12 exactly now look at the next verse and so 
after he had patiently endured, he obtained the promise. You know what that's talking about? That 25-year gap from Genesis chapter number 12 all the way to Genesis chapter number 21. That promise was obvious. And the promise, obviously, that's the foreshadowing of what was to come. That's what Hebrews chapter number 11 explains to you. That he obviously sees Christ through his son. He understands a lot of aspects just you know, in, in, this, in this figurative sense. But that immediate promise of what he was waiting on and what he was promised by God was given to him when he was 75 years old. And he had to wait 25 years to get it. That's a very long time. And you know what you need to do? You need to, you need to really, like he's talking about here, learn from the example of men that had patience, that had faith in God, and then they, they kept that faith through, the, you know, through those 25 years. Through, you know, there's many examples of many great men of God who had to uh, you know, endure you know, long periods of time. But I don't think that there's near a great example, near, even near as great an example as Abraham. 25 years. I mean, go back to Genesis chapter number 21. Imagine going through some sort of trial in your life. Imagine putting yourself in Abraham's you know, shoes and God promising you that he's going to bless you with, with this child. He's going to bless you, you know, in this way, making you a great nation and giving you this land. All the while you're wondering as a stranger in this land. All the while, you're, you're getting older and older and older. 25 years go by. I mean, what was he thinking at 20 years? What was he thinking at 22 years? When God told him 20 years ago, I'm going to bless you and you're going to have a son. And then 20 years go Do you think Abraham thought that 25 years were going to go by first before he brought forth his son? I'm sure not. I'm sure he thought, I'm going to Canaan. I'm going to be having a son probably in about nine, ten months, and I'll be possessing that land maybe in a couple of years. You know, I don't know what was going through his mind, but I'm sure he thought it was much more immediate than 25 years. You know what he did? He exercised patience. The word patience in the Bible oftentimes has more of a leaning of the word enduring, to endure. That's what that's referring to. It's talking about enduring. Not even necessarily in this context through any sort of works. It's talking about your faith. It's just keeping faith in God. The faith that you exercise every day as far as, you know, every week going to church, every day reading your Bible. Sometimes you may have some sort of problem in your life. You may have some sort of need or whatever it may be, anything, what have you. You know, we all have different trials in our lives, and a long time might go by, and you might start thinking, this isn't going to happen. You know, God's given up on me in this area. This isn't going to happen. But don't, don't give up on God. Sometimes God doesn't just come immediately. There's so many examples of that in the Bible, too. So many times in the Bible where people just aren't given exactly what God will prophesy about things immediately. There's so many examples of that. And this is a perfect one. Look there in Genesis chapter number 21. Look at verse number 6. And Sarah said, God hath made me to laugh. So that all that hear will laugh with me. I don't know if you've ever thought of this before. I've never heard anybody else say it. But it's, it, it seems very obvious to me the irony of which her son is named. Do you remember why she laughed in the first place? She laughed in mockery, didn't she? That God was saying she was going to have a son. So she ended up naming her son after laughter. Because, you know, she, it says here, God made me to laugh so that all that hear will laugh with me. I believe, personally, that's a reference back to her laughing. It's, a, it's, it's emphasized very much so in the Bible. You know, God draws attention to it. It's the only time, really, that you see her laughing. And then God calls her out on it like, thou this laugh, right? And then she ends up naming her son, you know, basically laughter or something along those lines. Uh, it's, it, it, it's strong irony, of course. Look at verse number 7. <clears throat> and she said, who would have said unto Abraham that Sarah should have given children suck, for I have borne him a son in his old age. Verse 8, And the child grew and was weaned. And Abraham made a great feast the same day that Isaac was weaned. And Sarah saw the son of Hagar, the Egyptian, which she had borne unto Abraham, mocking. Wherefore she said unto Abraham, Cast out this bondwoman and her son, for the son of this bondwoman shall not be heir with my son, even with Isaac. If you remember, of course, Hagar and Sarah uh, obviously have, have uh, an issue with their past as well. You know, when Sarah ended up conceding to, to Abraham while they were speaking and, and gave Hagar 
to Abram, two wives, that time Abram, of course, she ended up conceiving, Hagar did, and then her mistress, it says, was despised in her eyes. Hagar looked down upon her, and then at that point, you know, uh, or she looked down upon her, and then at that point, you know, Sarah was angry, and then basically treat, mistreated her, was mean to her so badly to the point that she fled and, and, and wanted to leave and not serve under uh, Sarai at that time. And, uh, you know, God told her, of course, to come back. Well, we see that it's being brought up again. Notice she's referring to her as the bond woman. She's, of course, trying to, you know, uh, uh, you know be, use a prerogative type of word here. She wants to, to be uh, derogatory towards her. Uh, so look at, uh, look at verse number 11. It says, And the thing was very grievous in Abraham's sight because of his son. Verse 12. And God said unto Abraham, Let it not be grievous in thy sight because of the lad. And it says this, and because of thy bondwoman, in all that Sarah hath said unto thee, hearken unto her voice. For in Isaac shall thy seed be called. So notice that God, you know, he, he basically uh, agrees with Sarah in this case, and he wants Sarah's advice or counsel to go forward. And he's saying, yes, Abraham, you know, I want you to go ahead and send Hagar, send the bondwoman, and send it's Ishmael, of course, her son away. Now, you know, some of these things you can disconnect yourself emotionally from, and you don't realize how big of a deal this is. But imagine, you know, this is his son, and, you know, Sarah may hate Hagar. You don't know how Abraham looks at Hagar, number one. But that's one, it's not obviously not right to have a multiplicity of wives, but that's one of his other wives. So he's got both of these women, you know, both of them are his wife. And he has his firstborn son while he was waiting for a son. Wow, you know, this is a, a you know, I'm sure very emotional and, 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 and significant to him in the first place because he's waiting on this seed for so long and he stumbles through his faith somewhat and ends up having Ishmael, of course. This ends up being his first, I'm sure Ishmael means a lot to him. And it tells you right here it's very grievous to him. It bothers him badly. Can you imagine having to send your firstborn away where he's not going to be living with you anymore and you're not going to be seeing him any longer? You don't know whether you're going to see him anymore. I mean, how horrible does that sound? That's what Abraham had to do. That's what Abraham had to do here. So you kind of can read over stuff like this, but he's just taking his son, he's taking Hagar, and he's just sending them off. Maybe I'll see you again, maybe I won't. That's horrible. That's sad. You know, that's grievous. I'm sure it bothered him you know, greatly like it says that it does here. And you know, we see that God goes along with it, and uh, I want you to read verse 13 here. It says this. It tells you, well, I'm going to uh, capitalize more, more so on why God goes along with it. It says in verse 13, and also of the son of the bondwoman will I make a nation. It says, because he is thy seed. I want you to go to Galatians chapter number 4. Galatians chapter number 4. Now verses 8 through 13, what we just read, that story about, about Sarah wanting or coercing Abraham to cast out the bondwoman, God uses this as a, an allegory, is the exact word that the Bible actually uh, ends up using here. In Galatians chapter number 4, this exact story is cited, and uh, we're told that this is, is, a, is an allegory. It makes sense then why God goes along with it and furthers that. Look in Galatians chapter number 4, I want you to look at verse number 21, it says this, Tell me, ye that desire to be under the law, do ye not hear the law? Verse 22. For it is written that Abraham had two sons, the one by a bondmaid, that was a bondwoman in the Old Testament, that's Hagar, the other by a free woman. But he who was of the bondwoman was born after the flesh. We kind of touched on that when that actually took place. How that was not through faith, that was him stumbling through the flesh. He was trying to just figure things out on his own, what is one from his own fleshly mind. Like the Bible says in John 1, it'll talk about the will of the flesh. That was the will of Abraham's flesh, wasn't it? It was him trying to just figure it out on his own. So it says, But he would but he who was of the bond woman was born after the flesh, but he of the free woman was by promise. It was by the promise of God. God performed all the work for that. Verse 24. Which things are an allegory, for these are the two covenants. The one from the Mount Sinai, which gendereth, or comes from, saying, to bondage, which is Agar. For this Agar is Mount Sinai. Now what took place in Mount Sinai? 
It's obviously where the law was given. That's what this is referring to. It's saying Agar represented the, this one promise, or this one covenant, I'm sorry, which was the law, right? And then it says this, verse uh, 25, it goes on and says, For this Agar is Mount Sinai in Arabia, and answereth to Jerusalem, which now is, and is in bondage with her children. But Jerusalem, which is above, is free, which is the mother of us all. Verse 27, keep reading. For it is written, Rejoice thou barren that bearest not, break forth and cry, thou that travailest not. For the desolate hath many more children than she which hath an husband. Now we, brethren, as Isaac was, are the children of promise. So there we see what the other, uh, the other side represents. What Isaac, the other child, represents the child of promise, of faith, of course. Look at verse number 29. But as then he that was born after the flesh persecuted him that was born after the spirit, even so it is now. So he's referring to the Jews at that particular time when Paul was living, of course. They were persecuting the Christians. And the Jews were the ones, hey, we're, you know, they're, they're of the flesh of Abraham, right? They're born of the flesh of Abraham. It's a perfect parallel, of course. That's why God ended up saying, hey, go ahead and send them away. And it may seem extreme, but God does things like for, that for examples in the Bible many times. And, you know, you, you know, you may look at God and say, why would he do something like that? But I can point out tons of examples where it may seem extreme and God tells someone to do something and he uses it perfectly for, or just for that example. You want to hear something worse than this? In the book of Ezekiel, you know what God tells Ezekiel to do? God actually, and he's the one. He says, by his stroke, he smites Ezekiel's wife and kills Ezekiel's wife. He does all of it for an example. He did, the whole purpose of it is, is to be an example. And then he tells Ezekiel even further, don't cry. Don't, you know, uh, I don't want you to mourn. I don't want you to shed any tears. I don't want you to do anything. And this is meant to be an example to the house of Israel. Just, you know, saying that he feels no remorse on the house of Israel at that time. So God will do things like this for an example. You have to think of the importance of the Bible. And uh, you know, that'll make you see these allegories and things like that. The grief that, that Abraham's heart was caused, there was a great allegory that's used. So you know what that does? That should help you treasure that truth, what God was willing to, with an understanding heart, of course, sacrifice in Abraham's uh, situation just so that he can create that allegory for you to have and for thousands and yeah, millions of people to read. Time after, you know, year after year and time after time. That's a, that's an, obviously shows it's an important truth. That should you magnify the word of God in your mind when you understand that. But so this right here, what took place, God uses as a perfect parallel of the Jews, the physical Jews who are not truly in spirit the, chi the children of God or the children of Abraham. They're only through the flesh, the children of Abraham. Just like a, just like uh, Isaac through Agar, which, which is through the law. It, it represents that other covenant. That's all that the Jews have today is that other covenant. That's all that they have. But it's not getting them anywhere because they've broken it. So, you know, the, the only way that anyone can have a, 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 a true relationship as a son of God is through the covenant of promise. It's the only way anyone can. Go back to uh, Genesis chapter number 21. So it says here in verse number 14 now, Genesis 21, 14, it says, And Abraham rose up early in the morning and took bread and a bottle of water and gave it unto Agar. I know a lot of men have been talking about their sleep schedules lately. I don't know if you noticed this, but in the Bible, very, very often, that's a common phrase. Rose up early in the morning. I believe it's in, I haven't even looked ahead, but next week we're in Genesis 22. And I'm almost 100% positive when God commands Abraham to take Isaac, even. Just showing further his great obedience, it says that he rose up early in the morning. Very common, it says, that men of the Bible, men of God, of course, would rise up early in the morning. It's a, it's a, it's a virtue to not lay in bed all day. It's a virtue to get up and get your butt to work and yeah. do something with your life and be productive. You know, it's, it's, it's a negative thing just to lay in and, and sleep all day and lay in bed. You know, uh, my wife's smiling. Yeah. She slept 8.30 today. So I'm going to uh, rebuke her in front of the congregation. I said something to her on the phone. Okay. All right, look there at the verse number 14 one more time. 
Uh, we'll read there. And Abraham rose up early in the morning and took bread and a bottle of water and gave it unto Hagar, putting it on her shoulder and the child, and sent her away. What a sad moment. And she departed and wandered in the wilderness of Beersheba. I mean, that's sad right there. She has nowhere to go. You notice what word it used? It says she wandered. She has no idea where she's going to go. This woman is a bond woman. Think about that. You don't know how long she... If she, if she came out of Egypt... With Abraham, she's long, you know, she's extremely far away from any of her, you know, family or kindred. She's just wandering around. You don't know what, you know, I'm, I'm sure that she speaks the language that, that, that Abraham speaks throughout this amount of time. But she's just wandering around in the wilderness, which is still a strange place. Has nowhere to go, no, no family that she can go to, just wandering around. That's sad. It's very sad. Sometimes you read the Bible, you need to try to uh, focus and put yourself in you know, these people's shoes sometimes. It says there further, verse 15, And the water was spent in the bottle, and she cast the child under one of the shrubs, and she went and sat her down over against him, a good way off, uh, as it were a bow shot. So it's telling you that's a far way. That's, that's far away. For she said, Let me not see the death of the child. So he's obviously becoming to the point where she thinks that thinks that this is serious enough to where he may die. They need water. They're becoming dehydrated, of course. And she sat over against him and lift up and lift up her voice and wept. And God heard the voice of the lad. And the angel of God called to Hagar out of heaven and said unto her, What aileth thee, Hagar? Fear not, for God hath heard the voice of the lad where he is. Notice, real interesting, verse 16, it actually tells you that she lift up her voice. But when you get to verse number 17, it tells you when God answered the prayer that he actually was answering the boy's voice. So you know what you can learn from that is he was praying. He's answering, if he's answering the son, they're both praying, obviously. Notice again, look at verse 17. And God heard, it says this, the voice of the lad. It's saying that he's praying. It's a perfect like an example of Romans 10, 13 being applied with a physical application. For whosoever shall call upon the name of the Lord shall be saved. You look at that phrase in the book of Psalms, it's obvious that David is talking about a war that he's fighting. It's something physical that's going on. Well, this is the same thing here. We see, you know, the lad crying out. That shows the good example that Abraham was able to set for his son. Even though, you know, he is born of the flesh, and people will, you know, always try to uh, appropriate the Ishmaels as being the Muslims, and they, you know, they'll always try to say, you know, uh, they look down upon them and, and talk bad about them, but then they try to uplift you know, the Jews over here while they're, you know, just for the sake of they, a misunderstanding of the Bible, really, where they think that just physical Israel is just blessed just because they're physical Israel. Well, the Bible says the exact opposite. You know, John the Baptist preached the exact, you know, he preached against that exact thing. You know, think not to say with yourselves that we have Abraham or our fathers. It means nothing. So, it shows you that God answers their prayers, too. You know what that means? If there's some lad of Ishmael, and they are of Ishmael, and he's over in Palestine, and he's over there in Iran, and he calls upon the name of the Lord, do you know what's going to happen? He'll be saved. He, God would save him just as quick as he would save the, the Jew that called upon him, and just as quick as he would save you know, some Chinese guy. And isn't it ironic, too, isn't it coincidental, at least, that the allegory of these two, Ishmael actually represents physical dude, doesn't it? When everybody always wants to, you know, downplay all the Muslims. You know, they want to, here's the thing. Yeah, it's a false religion, and they're wicked, and you know what? There are a lot of, like, you know, to, to say that just radical Islam, people go all the way to the other side when they just say that there is, there is no radical Islam, where people aren't trying to, like, take over the world and cut people's heads off. That's stupid, too. There is, there is a sect of that that's real. You know, but, but here's the thing. Within all religions, they're all wicked. So just to act like they're just the scum of the earth and, and to, you know, to try to deprive them of any sort of you know, uh, Christianity or not evangelize people like that, that's foolish and that's wicked. Yeah. To try not to, to go to the point where you don't care about their salvation, that's super evil. You right. should never get to the point like that. It, it, it's obviously something, uh, it's a very carnal heart is what it shows. It shows you it's a very carnal heart. People are very misinformed and sometimes it can be this just going off of what a pastor's saying. You know, stupid people like John Heggie and things like that. Just further proof you need to read the Bible for yourself because it's founded upon a misunderstanding of physical Israel right now anyways. 
you know, uh, the church, you know, all Baptist churches today are so confused about the relationship between the nation of Israel, between spiritual Israel. People are just so blinded about this today. It's, it's, uh, it's so crazy. Look at, um, look at verse number, uh, verse number 18 now. Arise! Lift up the lad and hold him in thine hand, for I will make him a great nation. And God opened her eyes, and she saw a well of water. And she went and filled the bottle with water and gave the lad drink. Verse 20, And God was with the lad, and he grew and dwelt in the wilderness and became an archer. I'll comment on something in verse 19 uh, quickly, and then we'll, we'll move on. But notice that God didn't cause this water to appear, did he? The water was there all, all along. It just says God opened her eyes. You notice that? It just says God opened her eyes. So it, you know, some people may misinterpret this and think that there's some sort of miracle where God just creates like an oasis out in the, the desert where they're located. That's not what happened. You know, it says that God opened her eyes to see the importance of, and this is, of course, you could, have, you could put a spiritual application on this, you know, of the importance of walking in the Spirit. And I, I firmly believe you live a sinful life. If you're walking in the flesh and you sit down to read the Word of God, you know, if someone backslides and they stop reading the Word of God, it's going to take you a while to get back in the rhythm. If you're living a sinful life, and even if, you, if your just mind is just filled with carnal things, with wicked things all day, and then at the end of the day you decide that you're going to sit down and pick up your Bible and read it, and you're just and sitting there in the flesh, you're not going to understand anything. You're not going to understand anything. You know, you know, we have the Holy Spirit. Obviously, people can go way too far, and I've touched on this enough, where people say, you know, you can, you can, you can never misunderstand anything in the Bible if you have the Holy Spirit. That's foolishness too, of course. Of course, you know, you, you know, there's still the element of the human sitting down and reading the Bible, but you have the Holy Spirit guiding you. And what will happen is God will not open your eyes, and He won't show you that well of water when you sit down and you're reading the Bible. It's, 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 uh, it's very interesting that Jesus actually likens the Holy Spirit as being a well of water springing up inside of us. So that's one of the uses, of course, of the Holy Spirit is to open our eyes, isn't it? Look at verse number, uh, verse number 21. It says, And he dwelt in the wilderness of Paran. That's virtually the same place of where they are now. And his mother took him a wife out of the land of Egypt. That's, of course, because she is an Egyptian herself. And it came to pass at that time that Abimelech and Phicol, the chief captain of his host, spake unto Abraham, saying, God is with thee in all that thou doest. Now therefore swear unto me, here by God, that thou wilt not deal falsely with me, nor with my son, nor with my son's son, but according to the, the kindness that I have done unto thee, thou shalt do unto me, and to the land wherein thou hast sojourned. That's almost uh, what people, oftentimes people refer to as like the, it's not almost, it is the same thing, as the golden rule, what Jesus teaches in Matthew 12, where he says, you know, that you have the way that, you know, you should treat others the way that you want to be treated, right? Well, that's what he's saying. He's saying, the way that I treated you, man, why don't you just treat me the same? That's what he's telling him right there. Look at verse number 24. And Abraham said, I will swear. And Abraham reproved Abimelech. That's like a, a, he corrected him. Because of a well of water, which Abimelech's servants had violently taken away. And then it says here, and Abimelech said, verse 26, I want not, that means I know not, who hath done this thing. Neither didst thou tell me, neither yet heard I of it, but today. We saw that Abimelech was a, seemed to be a righteous man. So uh, I, I, I would believe that he's telling the truth here. Look at verse number 27. And Abraham took sheep and oxen and gave them unto Abimelech. And both of them made a covenant. And it says in verse 28, And Abraham set seven ewe lambs of the flock by themselves. So those are female. Ewe lambs are female lambs. Verse 29, And Abimelech said unto Abraham, What mean these seven ewe lambs which thou hast set by themselves? So he asks, like, what's the purpose of these? What's the reason? Why did you put these seven just over here by themselves, right? Verse 30, and he said, For these seven ewe lambs shalt thou take of my hand, that they may be a witness unto me that I have digged this well. Wherefore he called that place Beersheba, because they swear, because there they swear 
both of them. So we can see that he, he gives them the, the, he gives these specific seven lambs to him. And obviously, if you seven, that means a lot to people at that time. You know, that's obviously their, their substance. This is something you're never going to forget. He wanted to give them, give him, give something to him that would be, you know, uh, uh, something that he would be able to remember, right? So he gives them these seven new lambs, and he says, this is going to be a witness. I want to give you something that I know we'll never forget because just this, you know, so that, so that between me and you, we know that this well is mine. I dug this well myself. That's the point. Because he was having trouble with people stealing his wells. We just read. Look at verse 32. Thus they made a covenant at Beersheba. Then Abimelech rose up and fight called the chief captain of his host. And they returned into the land of the Philistines. And Abraham planted a grove in Beersheba and called there on the name of the Lord, the everlasting God. And Abraham sojourned in the Philistines' land many days. We'll cross-reference a verse here, everlasting God. It comes up one other time, and I can't remember where it's at, but I know where one of them is. Go to Isaiah chapter 40. Go to Isaiah chapter number 40. This is somewhat of a famous verse. Isaiah chapter number 40. It is verse number 28. Isaiah chapter number 40, verse number 28. says this. <clears throat> Hast thou not known? Hast thou not heard? Then it says that the everlasting God, the Lord, the creator of the ends of the earth, fainteth not. Neither is weary. There is no searching of his understanding. I can't remember. Did anybody pull up the other time? That, when is it? 16, uh, Romans 16, 26. Oh, yeah, yeah. I do know where that's at. Where it talks about the things being manifest. Right. Yeah, yeah. I know what you're talking about. Yeah. Romans 16, 26? Yeah. Yeah, I'll, I'll turn there. You don't have to turn there. I'll turn there and read it to everybody real quick. Romans 16, 26. Yeah, it's like one of the last, last verses. Yeah, but now is made manifest and by the scriptures of the prophets according to the commandment of the everlasting God made known to all nations for the obedience of faith. So a prominent uh, statement like that, everlasting God, it's good just to know where all three of those are. It'd be good to walk out of here tonight, spend 15 minutes trying to memorize where those are located. I memorized that verse in Isaiah 40. I don't remember which verse it is exactly, but that we just read uh, uh, a, a few years back. That's how I knew where that one was, and I had forgotten. I remember there was one other location where everlasting God was was that? But it's good just to know where those people, the, you know, that's a pretty interesting phrase. And you go back to Genesis chapter number 21, and we see that Abraham called, it says, it, it says he called there on the name of the Lord, it says the everlasting God. So who is he calling on? He's calling on the everlasting God. The same God that's in the book of Isaiah, that Isaiah is, is uh, you know, preaching on behalf of, it's the same God Romans 16, that Paul's sitting down, or actually Tertius is sitting down, and Paul's speaking on him and, and giving him uh, you know, uh, those words. And who is that? It's, of course, the same God of Isaiah 9, 6, the everlasting Father. Yeah. That had to pop in your mind when you read that, right? So verse 34, read it one more time, the last verse, and then we will end in, uh, in uh, prayer. And Abraham sojourned in the Philistines' land many days. Let's bow our heads and have a word of prayer. Heavenly Father, God, we thank you for this evening. We thank you for your word. Uh, we thank you, dear Lord, for Bible study for this church. We ask you that you be with us and bless us, dear God. And uh, keep us safe and be with everybody here tonight and health and everything. In Jesus